Okay. I got Great. Pause bars. Jen's with me. I never said who the heck we were. I'm Matt Dillahoney, uh, and this is Jen Peoples. Yep. Uh, it came up. On yeah. The, I just got so distracted. I know. I don't it's know. okay. So what is it that we're actually going to talk about today? Well, we, from time to time, get email from people asking, you know, hey, religion is so pervasive. Do you think it had some kind of evolutionary explanation? Mm. What's, you know, what's the purpose of religion? And and as a, sort of an extension of that, do you think it's actually necessary for some people? Do you think people need religion in their lives for whatever reason? So I wanted to take a few minutes and address that topic uh, briefly. And so to get started, um, I, I want to say that there's actually, we need to distinguish between religion and belief in a God because um, they're slightly different. Um, there's several definitions of religion even. Um, and the definition that I'm using today uh, for this purpose is um, the rituals associated with someone's observance of their faith. So it's not the belief itself, it's the, rit the rituals that they um, use to observe that. And, and I guess some of the things that attach to those. So in talking a little bit about what religion um, did for human societies, earlier in our history, um, it's important to talk a little bit about what happened in hunter-gatherer societies versus what happened to agricultural societies, because um, the, the rise of uh, specific religious rituals, uh, as far as we know, correlates to um, the rise of agricultural societies. Um, so in hunter-gatherer societies, we typically looked at, at people in small groups, say 50 to 150 people, roughly. Um, and in groups that small, it's pretty easy to keep track of everybody. Um, you've got, you generally either know people or you're related to them, and everybody's reputation is known. And that's kind of an important thing because it turns out that um, reputational concerns dominate uh, people's behavior in a religious environment. Um, so also in hunter-gatherer societies, there's really no personal or private property, and there's just a few personal possessions. So there's not a lot of property that you can leave to your descendants. Um, so there's no concerns with inheritance issues. And punishment for antisocial behavior is pretty simple. You got kicked out of the group. Um, and we actually see this in um, modern-day hunter-gatherer societies uh, that have not been in some way contaminated by um, uh, modern societies. So the people that are actually remote and still live pretty much as um, immediate return hunter-gatherers, uh, you still see this sort of behavior. Now, we contrast that with agricultural societies, and in agricultural societies, you had much larger groups, and so it became impossible to keep track of everybody personally. Um, uh, you had to have some other system of doing this. Um, and you also needed a method of identifying group members. Um, and this is important because now you've got personal property, you've got something you can transmit to your descendants, and it's important that people from outside the group don't come in and get your stuff. Um, also, with more complex groups, you need a more formal way of transmitting the rules. And of course, the priesthood sort of filled in this, this gap of uh, having a formal way of transmitting the rules. And so, now that we have some idea of the difference between the two uh, groups, the hunter-gatherer people and the, the agricultural societies, you can move on to a discussion about what, how did religious rituals come into play? What did they actually do um, for these agricultural societies? Well, uh, one of the obvious things is that it serves as a means of group identification. Uh, you can identify the individuals who belong to this certain group because if they are following these rules, um, then you know, and it may be certain rules about dress, um, and uh, it might be certain appearance, like you're, um, married men are required to wear a beard, or you're required to cut your hair in a certain way. Um, there's other more costly signs of membership, like circumcision, for example. Um, and it also, um, some of these rituals kind of harken back to um, this ancestor worship that was probably pretty common in hunter-gatherer societies even. Um, but we see this in, for example, um, invoking a heavenly father. Um, clearly there's a, an allusion to um, ancestor worship there. And some of these rituals also promote group solidarity. 
So if everybody participates in some kind of uh, religious festival or something like that, and um, you know, it, you've got a whole group of people working toward some common goal, even if it's worshiping an ancestor, and so it promotes a, this sort of group solidarity. Um, another important thing that these early religious rituals did was that it minimized cheating. Okay, and this is very important because some of these rituals are very costly. I mentioned circumcision before, but also um, if you look through the Old Testament, there's you know rule after rule about sacrificing livestock. There's specific rules about you know, you've got to kill you know um, uh, a cow and um, a ram, and it one is for the the sin offering and the others for the burnt offering. But the bottom line is you're going to take these very costly animals and you're going to um, sacrifice them and nobody's going to derive any nutritional benefit from them. But providing this sacrifice is sort of an outward indication that, yep, I'm invested in this group and I'm so invested that I'm even going to risk my livelihood to promote the group's beliefs. <clears throat> now the other thing that happens is that um, this belief in this omniscient deity who's watching you even when other people can't um, minimizes, it, it, it inhibits antisocial behavior. So that's an important um, method of social control here. You've got people who, you know, God's watching you all the time. And, and there's, uh, there's even, uh, I was looking at a, um, a Christian school, private school, and one of the things in their handbook um, to the students was consider Jesus to be participating in any school activity. So they've got somebody watching them all the time. <clears throat> I remember growing up, I mean, of course, the, the idea that God knew everything mm -hmm. um, is, a, is a fairly good uh, deterrent to the, you know, for the people who have bought into that idea, but it's not completely effective. Mm -hmm. Because on some level, people tend to realize that they have managed to get away with things, or apparently get away with things. Um, and if there was somebody watching, that wouldn't be the case. Mm -hmm. And so there are there are times when the the various God concepts fail to be a sufficient deterrent. In which case, this is when the religions come in and reinforce this uh, idea. Uh, in my case, though what was most effective was the idea that my parents didn't necessarily have to be watching me, mm -hmm. but they were most likely going to find out everything I did anyway yeah. the, through the network of people that we lived around. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, and on more than one occasion, um, rather than mention how they found out, it was, you know, uh, God's not going to let you get away with this, which is how parents find yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, God is working through these other people to make sure your parents find out to enforce, you know, God's exactly, laws yes. on you. So. Yes. Well, and I mentioned before that, that religion provides a means of transmitting rules and also legitimizing uh, political authority. And this is kind of important when you get complex societies that they generally um, have some kind of government structure. And traditionally, the, uh, the priesthood, the religious leaders within a group have had some role in either sanctioning or in some way legitimizing a ruler. So there's this belief that the leaders are chosen by whatever god these, the people worship, and, it's, and therefore they're legitimate. So they derive their legitimacy from the fact they are chosen by God. And in some cases, for example, the Egyptians, there was a belief that the pharaoh was actually um, this human manifestation of a god. And so we, we still see it in some of the language here. We, you've heard the reference to uh, divine right of kings, right. as if, you know, kings have some, you know, divinity of, of their own. Um, and of course, more recently with George W. Bush, who believed that he was chosen by God to be the president. Yeah. Which, you know, may be the case because he clearly wasn't chosen by the people. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just can't pass up those golden opportunities. Well, and who knew Sandra Day O'Connor was God, right? Yeah. I don't know. So, she was really high on my list, but not quite yeah, to the God status. Either, yeah. So, um, so uh, this kind of brings up another point that uh, religion, in, in the form of these rituals, is actually this cultural trait. Um, and it kind of gets to the answer to one of the questions. It, 
um, does this have some kind of evolutionary advantage? Is there sort of like an evolutionary purpose to religion? And the answer is that no, not really. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that. Um, cultural traits are not subject to natural selection in the same way that, for example, genetic traits are. Um, relig religious rituals, any kind of cultural ritual, has a conscious purpose. Um, and you can lose your cultural baggage, but it's pretty hard to lose your genetic baggage. If you inherited the trait that predisposes you to type 2 diabetes, there's not really much you can do about that, but you can get over believing in a god. There are some cultural traits, though, in some aspects of religion that are subject to natural selection. If, you're, if your cultural traits are such that you take actions that can, you know, it reduce your, your chances of surviving. For example, if right. you're sacrificing too much livestock, right? that type of thing. Well, and, and that's a, the last point I was going to make on this uh, religion as a cultural trait. Um, the religion, the rituals emerged as a product of other traits that are adaptive. So while the religion itself might not be very adaptive, um, the, the traits underpinning them actually are. And those are things like social cohesion and um, altruism and cooperation. Um, and this um, being willing to obey your parents and, and wanting to please your parents. Right. And so that's why this, you know, invoking a heavenly father or parental figures in religious um, um, imagery is so powerful for people because it, it reinforces this natural tendency to want to please your parents and to do what your parents tell you to do. Yeah, and, and it's not, you know, this, this idea that religion is a byproduct um, isn't something we can, you know, prove to a high degree of certainty because we don't have a time machine. We can't go back and rewatch it. But it's it's not that much of a leap to apply some inductive reasoning to what we know about human behavior and say that okay, there is no evolutionary advantage to um, children being reliant on their parents, as you right. mentioned. That you know that that there is some wisdom in the people who have actually lived for a while to be passed on uh, to the young, and it's good that they're to some degree willing to accept it you know, with right. just like credulously, just bam, I, uh, yes, okay, we'll do it. So this reliance on authority, these things are good early on, but they don't always go away. Right. And it, 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 you, it, would, be, it would be ideal if we had, for example, a, a mechanism that made us um, reliant on authorities up to a certain age or a certain level of brain development, whatever, and then our reliance on authorities waned dramatically. Instead, I think it only wanes a bit. Mm -hmm. And that's why we end up, uh, oftentimes what people will do, in, will do is, is mistake which is the authority, which is where you get into fallacies along these lines. And so the reliance on authority um, and, and the other aspects that w would benefit in other situations kind of get clumped together in a little group and religion becomes that byproduct of uh, to kind of assuage the fear of the unknown and that type of thing. Yes.